turn to Isaiah chapter 1. We'll begin reading in verse 10. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law, or the word of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices Unto me, saith the Lord. I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear, the margin says, when you come to be seen before me. Who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. That means sacrifice of robbery. Bring no, no more sacrifices of robbery. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Our gracious God, we come before you in the person of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus. Everything that we have, we have reason to thank you for. Everything we have is of your hand, and we thank you, Lord, for everything that you've given us so freely. But especially and above all, we thank you for Christ, your Son. We thank you, Lord, that you called us out of our vanity from seeking to come before you by our way and that you saved us out of that and gave us spiritual discernment and taught us that Christ is the only way of salvation. Lord, we ask you to please help us now to hear you and to be able to enter into your word and to truly see Christ with the eye of faith and to worship you. Make us bow down in our hearts and cry out in praise and truly worship you. 
give you all praise and all the glory for everything you've done in saving our souls. Lord, we pray for Chloe and we pray for Debbie and Ravi. We're thankful, Lord, that there seems to be some good news. Thankful that she seems to be doing a little better. We thank you, Lord, for all our brethren who you've, the church here that you've caused to come together closer through this trial. We're thankful for our brethren in other churches that are praying for Chloe and Debbie and Ravi. Lord, thank you for using something so painful as these trials to, to bring your people together and to make us to behold Christ more and make us love him more and be more thankful for him. You've given several messages, Lord, that wouldn't have come except because you gave the trial. And we thank you for those, those words and pointing us to Christ. Lord, we pray for our sick brethren down in Arkansas. We pray for our brethren that are without work and those that are in places and folks we don't know about who are suffering from one kind of trial or another, Lord, that you've sent. We pray your will be done in everything, that you make us bow to your will and be thankful for your grace. Lord, forgive us our sins. Forgive us for not thinking on you more during the week for not reading your word more, for not hearing your gospel preached more, and for just flat out not believing you as we ought. Lord, forgive us our sins even now as we try to worship. We need you constantly, and we need you right now. It's in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we ask these things. Amen. All right. All right. Let's go back to Isaiah 1. Whenever a sinner engages in religious exercise, all of the outward means of, of worship. When a sinner engages in religious exercise without faith in Christ, it's idolatry before God. It's idolatry. No amount of zeal, no amount of our religious activity can atone for our sin. You read the words when we sing these songs. We just sing Rock of Ages. The second verse says, Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no longer know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. And that's what we are going to see in our text tonight. The question in this passage is, for what purpose do you sacrifice? For what purpose do you sacrifice? Now that's a variation of the next question that God asks a sinner in this series of questions we're looking at in the Scripture. He says there in verse 11, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord. Then in verse 12, he asked this question, When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Our text begins here in verse, in verse 10. 
And hear the word of the Lord. This is the word of God. He says, Ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the word of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. He addresses the rulers, the religious leaders, the civil leaders, and the people. And he calls them Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Those were the wicked cities full of that evil that God hates. Sodomy. Or as we politely tone it down and call it homosexuality. And for that, God poured out fire from heaven in judgment and destroyed those cities. He destroyed those cities. So is the Lord speaking to the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah? Is that who He's talking to here? No. Look back at verse 1. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So, if he's talking to the children of Judah, had they begun to practice sodomy like Sodom and Gomorrah had? No. It was something far worse than that. Well, then it must have been some base immorality that they were guilty of. No, not at all. I want you to notice, first of all, they were very religious. They were very religious. Verse 11, they made a multitude of sacrifices unto God. Burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed beasts, the blood of bullocks and lambs and of he goats, just like God commanded. Verse 12, they did this in God's house. God said they tread my courts. Verse 13, they observed new moons and Sabbaths. They called assemblies. They had the solemn meeting. They had appointed feasts in verse 14. Verse 15 says they were continually spreading forth their hands and making many prayers. They were a very, very religious people. And those sacrifices and those Sabbath days were commanded by God. They were commanded to be offered and to be observed by God. You see, that was God's ordained means of worship in those days. That was how men were to worship for that day. So when they heard Isaiah declare God's question. And he says, when you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? They would have answered, God, you did. You required us to do this. You commanded us to do these things. But did God require what they were doing? Did God require what they were doing? Listen to what God says about the children of Judah and what they were doing. He says there in verse 11, I'm full of the burnt offerings. He says, I delight not in the blood of bullocks. He says in verse 13, bring no more vain oblations. Don't bring me any more sacrifices of robbery, God said. He says, incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It's iniquity even the solemn meeting. In verse 14, he says, Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you, God said. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of of blood. Turn over to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. Listen to what God, how He describes it here. Verse 3. He says, He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. The man that kills an ox is, is guilty of murder. He that sacrificeth a lamb 
as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation is as if he offered swine's blood. Both a dog and a pig, neither one of them were allowed in God's temple. Neither one of them. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they've chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions, and I will bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. You see, God was not just looking on the outward he wasn't just looking at the form. If you would have looked at these people, here they were coming and doing these things. And here's another man coming and doing the same exact things. But to this one man, God says, you're worshiping an idol and I hate it. And to the other man, God says, I'm delighted in you. I'm well pleased with your worship. See, God was looking on the heart and with, He knew what their purpose was and God hated it. God knew they were not doing what He required and God hated it. You see, just as those sacrifices and observance of days was God's means of worship for their day, we have in our day a means that God has ordained for public worship. For instance, we make a, we begin, we make a public confession of faith in believer's baptism. And we become a member of the local church. We continually attend to the preaching of the gospel. We observe the Lord's table. We sacrificially support the ministry and needy brethren and our, and our missionaries with hard-earned money. We continue in prayer and in good works. We have a means of worship, a form, an outward form of public worship just like they had. Imagine if I stood here just like Isaiah stood up before them and I said, God says, I am full of your profession and your baptism." I delight not in your church membership. Your continual attendance under the gospel is an abomination unto me. Your observance of the Lord's table, I cannot away with it. My soul hateth it. Your support of the ministry and of needy brethren, of missionaries, is a vain sacrifice of robbery. And what if God said, when you spread forth your hands to make many prayers, I will not hear you. I'll hide my eyes from you. You're a trouble to me. I'm weary to bear you and your practices. Brethren, if you and I are doing what the children of Judah were doing, that's exactly what God says to us right here today. If we're guilty of what they were guilty of, that's what God says to us right here today. What made God say those things to them? What would make God say those things to a person in our day? Let's answer the first question. God asked, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? For what purpose are you sacrificing unto me? What is the purpose of this multitude of your sacrifices unto me? In Isaiah's day, their purpose was to try to make satisfaction to God for their sins. That was their purpose. Their purpose was to try to earn God's favor by making all these sacrifices and observing these days. That was their purpose. That was what was in their heart. And that was their purpose of heart. And today, there are multitudes doing the same thing. Multitudes today will join a church, they'll, they'll make a confession of faith, they'll be baptized, they'll join a church, they'll do all these different form, this different outward form of religion. Even if it's true, 
even if it's exactly what God ordained. Men will do these things, but they'll do them and in their heart be attempting to make satisfaction to God for their sins by these things, by the things they do, by coming to a church service, by, by praying many prayers, all these different things we read about right here. They're trying to earn God's favor. I had a friend that told me, he said, I'm looking for a church to join. And I said, well, why do you want to join a church? He said, well, I figure it's about time that I start making up for the first half of my life when I didn't go to church. And there's a multitude of people who go through religious exercises just trying to make up for their sins. Brethren, just like God said in Isaiah 66, if today, in our day, if we engage in religious activity, in religious, the, the true ways of the outward form of religion, if we engage in that, trying to make, make up with God, trying to make satisfaction for our sins, and trying to, to earn God's favor, we are guilty of idolatry just like they were. Guilty of murder. Crucifying the Son of God afresh. It's a sinful, it is sinful man choosing his own ways and his soul delighting in his abominations. Religious acts without Christ is damning. It's damning. The offense before God in Isaiah's day is the same as today. They did not believe on God's Son. That was the offense. That was the offense before God. They did not believe on God's Son. Sinners then and now are saved only through faith in Christ. Only through faith in Christ. Go with me to John 14.6. John 14, 6. I want everybody to read this. You know, we, we go into some really deep things of God, trying to learn more and more about Christ and what He accomplished, but sometimes we need to step back and look at some basic things because there's a lot of folks that are doing just what we're talking about here that just come thinking this is what God's pleased with, just the outward form. But look at here. Look at this right here. Read John 14. 14.6 with me. Willie boy, look on, look on there with you, mother. John 14.6 Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That means he's the only way to God. That means he is the truth. He is everything this book is declaring. And he is the life. He is eternal life. He is heaven. There is no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Go to 1 John 5. 1 John 5. And look at verse 10. <clears throat> 1 John 5, 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He's born of the Spirit. He's the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. He has the witness in himself. But he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. It's in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Look with me at Acts 4. Acts 4 and verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is 
none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Go to John 6 real quick. John chapter 6. What about, what, what about our works? What must we do? This is, what, this is the question that men always have. What must we do? Surely we, there's something we need to do. Look at John 6 and verse 29. Or let's look at verse 28. They said unto Christ, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on Him whom He hath sent. So why did God command that they bring those sacrifices then? Why, what was God's purpose in commanding they bring those sacrifices if salvation is through faith in Christ? It's because all those sacrifices typified Christ. They all pictured Christ. And so when the true believer, those that really were born of God and given faith to believe, when the true believer came to the high priest and he brought, a, he brought the burnt offering and they burnt that offering and they burnt that fat and he smelled that sweet savor of that fat going up to God through faith. He beheld the coming Christ, the Lord Jesus, of whom it said He loved us and gave Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. When the high priest burned incense, the true believer smelled that incense and saw that incense going up, rising up, and he beheld Christ in spirit, making intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He beheld Christ even in the incense. When the true believer rested from all his physical labor on the Sabbath day, through faith he beheld Christ who came and worked all the works necessary for our salvation. So that now he that's entered into Christ our rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his at the appointed feast called Passover. That was one of the appointed feasts. And at the Passover, while the others were just trying to make satisfaction by bringing the actual sacrifice, the true believer, he was beholding Christ, the firstborn Son of God, who laid down His life and was slain in place of His people so that when Christ, our everlasting Father, the head of the house, just like the Scripture said in the Passover, when the head of the house, Christ our Father, has applied the blood to the doorposts of our heart and given us faith to rest in Him, when God sees Christ's blood, He passes over us. He doesn't pour out judgment on us because Christ already bore that judgment for us. That's what the true believer held in that appointed feast called Passover. Now in our day, these means that God has ordained for worship, just like it was in the old day, the true believer, and these, even in the means God's ordained, we behold Christ in these things. When we confess Christ in believers' baptism, we see our brethren go, un, go under the water and come up out of the water. We behold how that in Christ, we were crucified. Our old body of sins, our old man was crucified and died. And we were buried. And when, we, when Christ arose, we arose in Him to newness of life. Paul said in Romans 6, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into, uh, unto Jesus Christ were baptized unto His death? Therefore we're buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Those born again of God, they unite with other believers in a local church body. You know why? What do we behold in that? Christ is the head and His church is His body. And by God's grace, He's made us members of that body. We're members of Christ's body, of Christ's own body. 
Scripture says, now you're the body of Christ and members in particular. In our day, we don't offer those sacrifices or observe Sabbath days. Today, we gather and we use those pictures to do what I just did, to see Christ in them. And we worship Christ through the preaching of the Word. That was preaching in their day. Those sacrifices and that high priest and everything he was doing in that tabernacle, that was their preaching. Today we don't offer those. Today we take those types and those shadows. We preach Christ from them. We preach the gospel. And that's how we worship Christ in this day. And this is, our, this is what we rejoice in. Go to Colossians 2.10. Here's what we rejoice in when we hear the gospel. Here's why we don't worship according to those sacrifices anymore. Colossians 2 and verse 10. You are complete in Christ. You are complete in Christ. That's the good news. Look down at verse 14. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. All the law which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. Look at verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come. Those were just pictures. But the body is of Christ, the express image, the fulfillment is Christ. And so that's why we don't offer those sacrifices anymore. That's why now we come and we hear the gospel preached through those sacrifices, using them as types and shadows of Christ. At the Lord's table. We don't just come to the Lord's table because by that, by that religious exercise we expect to earn God's favor. We come to the Lord's table to show forth the Lord's death till He come. We come to the table to remember His broken body and His shed blood by which we've been made the righteousness of God in Him. And then, as believers give sacrificially to help one another, we behold the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who though He was rich, yet for our sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be made rich. And then when you behold a believer do a good work, we don't let see our own good work, but when you behold a fellow believer do a good work, we, we, we thank God who works His will in His people to do that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we give, we give Him all the glory and all the praise. You realize that when they came to that tabernacle, we, I'm going to... Maybe I'll preach on this sometime. I preached on it a long time ago. But when they come to that tabernacle and those priests were washed, picture of a, of a, that lamb was slain and then the priests were washed. It's a picture of Christ redeeming us and us being born again, made priests unto God. But when those priests entered in to do any service to God in that temple, I mean in that tabernacle, you realize the entire floor of that tabernacle was made out of silver. Can you imagine what that looked like? It was made out of silver. And that silver was redemption silver. That silver was the silver they collected because all the firstborn had to be redeemed. Remember that? In the old covenant law, they had to be redeemed. And so they brought that shekel of the sanctuary and God said, take those shekels now and you melt them down and make the tabernacle floor out of that. And that's what they made it out of. And the picture is this. Here you have a high priest, a picture of a, or a priest, a picture of a believer who's been, who's been justified by Christ's blood and washed in regeneration. And he goes now, he can go into, the, into God's house and he can... He can serve God now. But everything He's doing is on the foundation already laid of redemption accomplished. He's not adding anything to that foundation. That means, brethren, whatever we do in the service of God, we're not trying to make satisfaction. We're not adding anything to what Christ has already accomplished. 
believers do everything on the foundation of Jesus Christ our Lord, our righteousness, our redemption, the one in whom it's all finished. Everything is on that foundation. So today, the same as then, there were means that God ordained. But believers only use the means to worship Christ. We don't worship the means. We don't worship the means. We use the means to worship Christ. Let's answer the second question. God said in verse 12, Isaiah 1, 12, When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Then and now, vainly religious men would say, Well, God, you required that we come to you by this means. You required it. And that's not what God's asking them. God's asking them this, Who hath required satisfaction be made at your hand in my courts. Who's required satisfaction be made at your hand in my courts? God never said satisfaction could be made by a sinner's hand offering sacrifices. Never. Never. Go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And look at verse 1. The law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. They couldn't do it. Verse 4, For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. The same is true in our day. Satisfaction to God is not made by any of these religious exercises. It's not made by our will. Satisfaction is not made by our will. And satisfaction is not made by our works. It's not by our decision for Christ, not by our being baptized, not by our going to church, not any of these things. Satisfaction to God's broken law is made one way. It's made by Christ fulfilling God's will and sanctifying those whom God separated in Christ before the foundation of the world. It's by God's will and by Christ's work fulfilling God's will. Look here in Hebrews 10.5 Wherefore when He, Christ, cometh into the world, He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. No satisfaction has been made. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it's written of me. I come to do thy will, O God. Look at verse 9. Hebrews 10, 9. The second part there says, He taketh away the first, that covenant of work that He may establish the second, the everlasting covenant of grace. Verse 10, By the which will, by God's will, we're sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Satisfaction is by God's will being, being uh, fulfilled by Christ's works. It's not by our will and our works. God's will is, is fulfilled by Christ's work. And look at verse 11. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Can you believe in 2018 they're still doing it? Men are still doing the same thing. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. God began this passage by calling the children of Judah Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. And the reason he did that is because what they were doing trying to be saved by their will and their works, is symbolized by sodomy, by homosexuality. 
And you ask, how is that so? A man and a man cannot produce fruit. A man and a man cannot produce children. They can't produce fruit. And he started out there addressing the rulers and the people. The rulers, the religious leaders, were telling the people, man and man, how to produce fruit. And none of them ever produced any fruit to God. Ever. And so that's a, that's a spiritual sodomy. It's a spiritual homosexuality to try to come to God by your will and your works. Yesterday, a man who was the, the prominent teacher for the past hundred years died. And, and he would have stadiums full of people. One reporter yesterday said he was at one of his crusades and he said that when he gave the, when he gave the call to come down to the front, he said it was like, it was like uh, fans in, a, in the stadium rushing the floor when their team had won the championship. People just rushing to the front. Why? Because he was telling people they could be saved, they could be born again by their will, by making a decision for Christ. And by that, by their will, they made Christ's work, His blood, effectual for them. And then he would tell them by their works, you can be made progressively more and more holy by your works of law keeping. Either righteousness and holiness is all of Christ apart from you and I contributing anything, or this book is a lie. One of the two. You see, that's a type, that's, that's symbolized by homosexuality. Because it's a spiritual sodomy. And see, now in this day, just like God called Judah, Sodom and Gomorrah, the reason you see in our day that God has judged this nation and turned us over to a nation of homosexuality, where everybody condones it, everybody thinks it's fine, it's, it, the root cause of it goes back to men in pulpits preaching salvation by man's will and man's works. That was the cause of it. You look at this chat, look at this passage. God, that's what they were guilty of. And God called them Sodom and Gomorrah. And before it was over with, God turned them over to do physical homosexuality. That's the judgment of God. We got a country full of self-righteous folks who are guilty of spiritual sodomy. Now everybody under the sound of my voice, please hear what I'm about to say. God never required any sinner to ever attempt to make satisfaction for our sins, ever. He never required that. Christ alone made satisfaction to God, and it's only through faith in His blood that we're saved. Now, lastly, go back to Isaiah 1. Lastly, if a sinner is trying to save himself by his will and his works, what does God command him to do? He says in verse 16, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil. That, in our day, is faith. That's faith. He's calling on them to repent from the evil of trying to make satisfaction by their will and their works. That's the evil. And believe on Christ. And you see, when, when God has sent the Holy Spirit and washed us in regeneration and purged our conscience through this gospel, through the blood of Christ, that's when He gives you faith and repentance. Repentance from the dead evil work of trying to make satisfaction to God by your will and your works and He gives you faith to simply cast it all on Christ and rest in Him. He does it through this gospel. We say, wash you, make you clean, but you can't do it unless God washes you and makes you clean and then you'll cast your care on Christ. Why tell a sinner to do it then? Because God told us in the Valley of Dry Bones, tell them to live. Tell them to wash themselves and I'll send forth my spirit, and I'll make them live, and I'll make them wash in the blood of Christ. That's why we preach it. 
And then this is love right here. With, with, with faith, always God gives a heart of love. Right here, verse 17. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Work righteousness amongst your brethren and amongst your fellow man. And when He gives you a heart of faith, He gives you a heart of love. Faith and love. That's what Christ gives when He creates a new man within us. And when He gives you a heart of love, you fulfill that command right there first and foremost by bringing your friends and your loved ones to hear the gospel of Christ. That's the first number one way we love our brethren and our friends. Bring them to hear the gospel of Christ. Because it's through this gospel that Christ makes judgment settled and relieved us from the oppression of the law and from legal tyrants preaching law to us. And it's through this gospel that Christ helps needy, helpless sinners like us who are as helpless as an orphan and a widow. And the second way that we love and do these things is to actually work what is just and right between our brethren and our fellow man. And this is the heart of a believer. This is what a believer wants to do when he's put this new heart within you. You don't want to come to God anymore by your works. You don't want to... I'm so afraid that anything I do in religious exercise is just going to be for show. That scares me to death. I, I want to guard against that more than anything else. I don't want to pray just for show. I don't want to, I don't want to come here and do anything in this service just just for show or thinking that it's going to put me in better favor with God. I don't want to do that. I don't want that to ever enter into it. And that's the heart of every believer. We turn from that evil work. And all our cares on Christ. And not only that, brethren, we love one another. God's given us a heart of love. I was talking to Ravi this week, coming down the elevator. It's trials like this that, you know, we're all busy, we all have our lives, and, and we don't necessarily call or go to see one another all the time. But when you have a trial like this, God, one of the reasons He gives it is so we get to see just how truly our brethren love us. And you see brethren come together. You see brethren truly mourning with you and praying with you and, 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 and begging God with you and hurting with you. And you see they love you. And this is the heart of brethren. We're not under law. We're not under legal restraints. We're not under anything. Our motive in everything is the love of Christ toward us. That's the best motive. That's the only motive. It's the love of God toward us. You see, their heart's motive. It's not the outward. It's not the outward by which you see the motive. They were coming and doing just what God commanded. And they were doing what others who were accepted of God were doing. But the motive in their heart was not the motive of the believer. The motive in their heart was, their motive was to try to make God indebted to them. Our motive is we're constrained by the love of Christ for us. And that makes you want to do what God says do. Believe on Christ and love one another. And that's the only rule we're under, brethren. Faith which works by love. Amen. All right, Brother Eric.